Your conference is being recorded. Great. Well, welcome to our Lunch and Learn. This month we are talking about um, understanding action taking using the PI tools. Um, so when we look at how people take action, there's really two different responses that we look at. We look at it from a proactive and a responsive perspective. Some people are more inclined to be proactive when it comes to taking action, picking up the ball, driving change, moving things forward, while others are created to be more responsive, that as things happen, they take a breath, let's look at this, let's look at the whole picture, let's put together a plan. So we're going to look at how that can be derived from PI and then some other things with the other drives that can impact that. To start out, though, sort of the opposite inside of that, you know, the, the positive side of a proactive person is that they are proactive. They can pick things up. They drive change. One of the, the pitfalls of that is that there can be a heated reactiveness kind of in that moment, not thinking, just doing, um, where sometimes that can work out well and sometimes not. It's something to be aware of. These are what I like to call the double-edged swords, right? And then the other side of a more responsive is, Ending up in that analysis paralysis, or as my cartoon here says, paralysis by analysis, um, sometimes we can just get so stuck in being a little overwhelmed by the um, actions that need to be taken and get stuck in the planning that we don't actually take those steps forward to take action. So we're going to be looking at both the, the proactive, the positive sides of both and some of the cautions. So let's take a peek at all of the four drives and how they relate and impact action taking and taking action. So when we're looking at the drives from the high side, the way that the dominance drive, and I'm sure all of you are fully aware at this point that dominance is the drive to, right, the drive to influence people or events. People with a higher level of dominance are self-starters, self-motivated, they're competitive, goal-oriented, and independent. The way that's going to impact that taking action is they're going to look at it from more of an independent lens. They're really setting sights on goals and moving through any obstacles they need to get there. And they'll do that in a competitive way, especially an individually competitive way rather than a team competitive manner. And they don't need anyone else to get them started. They're likely to just go ahead and pick it up when they have an idea or a goal in mind. They're self-motivated, self-starter. They don't need someone to guide them in the direction of where they need to go. So that has a strong impact on how someone takes action, and we're going to look a little bit deeper into how that works with some of the other factors as we move along here. The second factor, extroversion, which is the drive for connection, how this impacts is uh, there's a high level of collaboration here. People with high levels of extroversion are relationship-focused. They tend to be the connectors, and they tend to be really passionate about whatever it is that they are taking actions on. So how that impacts that taking action is they may be a little bit more persuasive and passionate about what they're driving forward. They may tend to bring other people in and be more collaborative about how we're, we are going to move this forward. Because they're relationship focused, they're really going to think about the impact of the action on other people. And as a natural connector, they're going to think of who can we bring in to help drive this forward? Where can we get this person? How can we leverage these people? So this is really sort of the relationship portion of any action that needs to be taken. When we're looking at patience, which is the drive for consistency, a high level of patience is um, calm, relaxed, and easygoing. These are people that are slower to jump into action. They look at the whole picture. They really want to mitigate any intensity around it. So if the house is on fire, they want to calm that pressure down. The other thing is they need a little bit more ramp time before they actually move into action. So. This is where we are a little bit more of that responsive of, all right, let's take a look at everything. Everyone take a deep breath. 
we'll move forward, but let's put a plan together in place and let's look at the whole picture of what we need to do here. That patience factor, that C factor, is the second half of having a lot of impact on taking action and a lot about how the A and the C relate to each other. We're going to get into a little bit of that in a few minutes. Finally, formality, which is the drive for rules and structure. Now, how this impacts someone with a high level of formality impacting taking action. They have a need for clarity and direction. They tend to take action based on facts. They're going to look to the rules or the rule book or what has worked in the past for guidance when taking action. And they're really going to seek the path to do things the right way or what they perceive is the right way. So when it comes to taking action, they're made the decision that got them there is based on facts, and we'll talk a little bit about that next month. But when the actions are taken, I want to do it the right way. I'm going to look to those rules to guide me as to what that right way is. If those rules aren't there, I'm going to look at whatever facts I have available to me. And if that doesn't work, I'm really going to need some clarity and direction from, out, from outside. So the A and the C, the big ones, and these are all from the high level. Next, we're going to be looking at how lower level impacts taking action. So when we're looking at dominance, again, this is the drive to influence. Lower levels of dominance manifest as harmonious, agreeable, team focus. They really want to focus on how the actions impact others. So this is a little bit more to about the relationship side of things. It doesn't necessarily need to be my idea. I may look to others for what the action steps need to be. I may look to the project plan. I'm going to look at the whole picture of how things are because I'm more harmonious and less competitive. When it comes to extroversion, the driver need for connection. With a lower level of extroversion, I'm going to focus on what tasks need to be acted upon first. I'm a little bit more independent, again, in how I contribute to taking action. And I'm going to share my ideas after careful consideration. So when I take action, I'm very sincere in it. I've thought it through. I've planned it out, likely. And it's going to be very task-focused. I'm not likely to think of the impact on others or who can help move this forward. It's going to be more from an independent view again. With a lower level of patience, or the drive for consistency, low level of patience has a high sense of urgency. Almost everything is on fire depending on how low you go with, those, with the patient. But this is also where that push and drive comes from, that push and drive for change most specifically. They, there can be an intensity to it. They are quick to act. So this is where I'm going to jump in. I'm going to be proactive. I'm going to pick that ball up. I'm going to run with it. And I can get a lot done in a really short amount of time. I'm, I perform well under pressure because I seek highly pressurized situations. I'm not trying to mitigate the pressure. I'm working in with the pressure. I create it. I like it. I work well in it. So when it comes to taking action, if I have a lower level of patience, I'm going to jump all over whatever needs to be done and move quickly through it. I may not look at the whole picture. I may just be looking at a small sliver, but I'm going to start somewhere. And then finally, formality rules for structure, uh, drive for rules and structure. On a lower level, they prefer and give fewer details. So they don't need as much of the detail and the pictures to see what's going on. They can be pretty creative in their approach to the actions that are being taken. So they're not beholden to the rules. Therefore, they're not going to look to a rule book. They're not going to worry about getting it right. They're just going to kind of jump in, start it. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. We'll try something else. So when it comes to taking action, they're very flexible and very comfortable in the gray or ambiguous. If there isn't a clear path to be taken, they're okay just starting and figuring it out as they go along. There tends to be in this space a really big picture focus, however, 
so we're not starting taking action on those granular details, but high sweeping wide action. So again, the A and the C and how they combine together are the most important, but that B and the extroversion and the formality are really going to bring in and give us some more information. So next up, I really want to dive into that AC relationship a little bit deeper. Um, so for the, the purposes of just understanding and training, what we're looking at here, the, that first column, the proactive column, where the A is higher than the C, this is generally, and what's written here more specifically, if the A is high and the C is low. So just for your information, it will still have some impact this way if both are on the high side or both are on the low side. But for teaching purposes, we're just going to look at it if the A is high and the C is low. And so this is where that, that thriving under pressure really kicks in even more. They have a very positive response to pressurized situations and will take action really quickly inside of it. Because they adapt easily and they're a change agent, they can shift and change inside that action. They're decisive and proactive. Um, when they're in the mode of taking action, especially, their listening <laughs> isn't the greatest. <laughs> um, they're in action mode. They're driving forward. They're pushing change. Um, so understanding that maybe they're not hearing other views at this moment. On the flip side, we've got our C on the high side, A on the low side. These are our responsive action takers. So they're a little bit more tentative when it comes to pressure. Again, some people really want to mitigate that pressure, so they're going to look to craft a plan to depressurize the situation instead of using that pressure to drive things forward. Doesn't mean that each can't be good under pressure. It's just that one has a positive response and uses it, where the other tends to want to mitigate it by putting solid, calm action into place. When they're moving into that adaptive place, they're going to need a little bit more time and understanding why. So that's why they're going to look at that whole picture. They're going to take a breath, take a beat, let's look at what's going on before we start anything. Let's not make waste any um, action that doesn't need to be taken. So when they do take that action, it's very thoughtful. Um, it's been carefully crafted and in a responsive way. And they're absolutely, when they're creating this action plan, they're listening. They're listening intently and thoroughly to what's going on and what's happening in order to get those clear steps of what to take next. Now, as I mentioned in our first side, you know, the good sides of proactive are they picked up the ball, they run with it, they go. It's, you know, the pressure's on and they can act. The downside of that is that sometimes it's more of a reactive nature and not all the way thought through or they haven't listened to everybody or looked at it from all angles. Sometimes that's exactly what's needed just to get it started and get it going. And sometimes we do need a little bit more space in there. Whereas the other side, the more responsive, again, we've got nice, calm, measured out, good action planning. But they can sometimes get stuck in the planning section and not then take that next step. The other drives are going to impact that. So again, if I've got a high level need of detail, it's going to take me even longer to move that forward. I'm going to want all of the answers before I take that action. So really thinking about looking at it from this AC relationship first, and then adding in my people and my details with the B and the D and around it. But this is your base place to look at how someone is going to approach taking action. And as you can see, if you've got a team and you have team members that are built oppositely, they're going to look at how we uh, um, approach taking action very differently and could possibly lose a lot of understanding here. So someone who is proactive, who's like, oh, let's get up and go and do it, doesn't always understand why the responsive needs that much time and can get there can be frustrations there. So this is a really good place to look if you've got frustrations surrounding taking action on your team to start to look at these factor combinations of the members on your team. So as we're looking at teams, 
Another way to do that is to use the teamwork styles. So this is a snapshot of um, a fake team that I've created here. But to give you an idea, this is the overall how we approach teamwork. Um, so when you create this in the system, you're going to get this as your first view. And each of those blue dots is a member of the team. When you click on one of the um, quadrants there, on the right-hand side, you'll be able to drop down and see what the strengths and the challenges and some coaching or key tips for people that fall within that quadrant. There is a printable or, or downloadable version of this now. So I highly suggest after this, you go and put your team into the teamwork styles to really see how do we approach teamwork as a whole. On each, uh, at the top, you'll see that there are three tabs. Um, there'll be communication, taking action, and decision making. So th those are the three series that we're working on with these Lunch and Learns. Last time was communication. If you missed it, definitely go out to the website and check it out. Next month will be that um, decision making. So here we have this team broken out by their teamwork style taking action. As you see, I've highlighted the indicators that they've used to create this matrix here. So you see there's the A over C and C over A, and then a high D or a low D. When we click on any of those quadrants, it's going to give us um, infer, you know, insights as to our innovating people. And innovating tends to be, you know, they're the ones that are going to challenge things. They're, you know, thinking of all the big ideas but they're never going to actually follow through on everything. The implementation can get a little trickier there. So with your innovators, you would definitely want some implementing. So we've got a couple implementers on our team as well. Those are the ones that are actually that process and procedure driven. Once that idea has been created, they're the ones that are going to execute and follow through on making sure that that idea becomes processed. We also have our commanding, which on this team, there isn't any. This is someone who can kind of come down and say yes or no, that commanding action style is having that strong opinion about how it should be done and seeing that it gets carried out in a certain way. And for certain teams, that's very important to have people that are built like that on it. Having some um, balance with that of a coordinating. You're coordinating our people that – really want to get things done with everyone on board. They're going to look at that from a collaborative viewpoint. They're going to use their relationships and their genuineness, um, their genuine care of people to kind of bring it together. So while you've got your commander who's a little bit more independent in how they see things, your coordinating, just um, taking actions are going to be a little bit more team focused. So that will balance that out there. So really looking at all four segments, where people fall, and you may be able to gain some insights as to, wow, that makes sense why these two people really like working together, or why these two people, while they're opposite, get a whole lot done. I'm going to keep pairing them on projects because an innovator and an implementer on a project together can make a lot of stuff happen, and they tend to work really, really well together. So kind of breaking it down that way, great tool for you to work with in the system. Another tool that's really helpful is the relationship guide. So this is actually um, a breakdown of that implementer and that innovator. So we've got the maverick there, which is on the innovator side. This is someone who doesn't see the details and, quite frankly, doesn't worry about seeing the how of how we're going to get there. They think of the idea. They jump into action. They're ready to move things forward. And the balancer of that, the stabilizer of that, is our guardian there, where they'll come in, pick up those details of the action to actually move it forward. They may be slower to jump in, but that's okay because the part of the action that they're working on maybe has a longer ramp time. So looking at the team members, or people that you work with on a one-on-one -on -one basis um, as well here can give you some insights as to, right, okay, so one side is that A over C, the other one is the C over A, but we have the potential to work really well together 
if we have conversations about, I like to work under pressure. I like to drive things forward. I get very passionate. I'm excited. I talk fast. I move fast. And I'm probably going to leave things until the end because I get a creative rush when I have that pressure on. But I understand my coworker or my partner on this project works differently than that. She needs a little bit more planning and timing. So we're going to check in more often as we move things through. I'm going to ask for the opportunity to work in some of those pressurized situations, but still giving her the opportunity to be responsive and move things forward in a consistent manner. So when we're looking at each of these two, there's the um, management strategy guide in the system. That middle section is all based on how they take action. So having really clear and specific ways and these can be used not only to manage the people below you, but I really recommend using these for people who are going to be working on projects together or partners together to really see from peer to peer what I can do to help make sure that this project or this action that we're taking or taking action inside of a project can be helpful and I'm not missing anything. There's also usually a couple others. So in this instance, they're the ones in green. Um, really understanding that giving clear, concise goals and explicit communication about expectations, that's going to help this person take action, right? So once they have all of that, they'll be able to kind of move forward, as well as clarifying task requirements and the process and the steps needed to achieve the result. So they really need to know what those steps are before they can actually complete that goal or com complete that action. Conversely, here's the other side of the situation where, again, green boxes are helpful to know when it comes to taking action, and that blue bar in the middle is all about taking action. But really now letting this person be independent and have control over their own activities and their own actions they need to take, but provide them with high-level goals and let them achieve them in their own way. So that, again, is the management strategy guide. And that's how you can use that when looking at taking action, so that middle bar, and then anything else that has to do with um, control over the activity or how they receive the information on being able to take action. Next up, we have the reference profiles. These are really helpful. There's a specific section there, as you see with the blue, the first blue arrow, um, about action and taking risks. So half of our duo here is a maverick who thinks risk is necessary, right? So they're going to, that end justifies the mean and they're really quick to act in it. And you see the star at the bottom there, um, how to work with them. That first one is all about they want to take the action. They want that ability to move fast and move forward. So understanding that about them to work with them um, can be helpful. The smaller blue arrows, and there are some other places that have to do with taking action as well but just simply looking through the tools that are in the system through that lens of how do they respond to pressure and challenge? How do they bring people into the planning and execution? Um, how do they deal with the frustration with delays in action? And how do they adhere to that structure or direction when taking action? Another really helpful tool in the system are the pattern insights where I place the star there, that's that AC relationship where you'll automatically know whether they're proactive, responsive, or a hybrid of the two, more adaptive. That would be the first place to look if you're putting together a team or a partnership on balancing out how people take action or putting people together who are quick to take action and people that are more responsive and slower. I forgot those are loaders. So anyway, this slide was just to let us know that the three biggest areas that impact workplace dynamics are that communication, taking action, and decision making. So we've come to the end of our second in this series of taking action. The next one will be October 25th, and that will round out this little series with the decision making. Um, if at any time you want other um, clarification or webinars or any information about what we've talked about here or anything in the new system or how to leverage these tools, please reach out to us. We love doing these things with you, um, and we are here to support you in any way.
So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now and open it for questions. As soon as her voice 